willing to run five miles this year? Five miles. Okay, I see a hand or two. All right, all right, good, all right. Yeah, well, you can build back up to that, Reynolds. Okay, speaking of 10 miles, how many of you are willing to say, I'm going to run 10 miles this year? At one time, or 10-mile continuous run. <laughs> Am I online at this moment? <laughs> are we online? All right, welcome to the final presentation of Media and the Brain, part three. So excited to have you here. We've been talking about Bible texts here this evening while you were gone about running, so we'd like to encourage you all to keep up your good work and healthy exercise. This evening, as we focus on the brain and New Year's resolutions, we should focus on keeping our mind active and healthy in regards to the, the work that's before us. I'm still having a hard time thinking, so... I want to thank Little Light Studios for giving these presentations. Keith Detwater, thank you for your presentation. I'm looking forward to it tonight. And um, for those of you who aren't here and able to see the merchandise from the back, I would just like to encourage you to go to Little Light Studios' website. Check out all that they have. They've got lots of material there, and you will be blessed. The time is well worth it. Keith, I'd like to begin with a word of prayer and ask God to be here this evening. Father in heaven, we are so grateful on how you have given us the capacity to, to think and to communicate and to reason and how you still want to be involved in directing our lives. Lord, this evening we pray that you would bless our, our, our meeting and our presentation as Keith shares with, with us about media and the brain. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, welcome again. Thank you all for breathing the evening and the cold and coming out tonight. Thank you for those who are joining online. appreciate all of your support. This presentation will be a lot less about your brain and more about history. And this is one of my favorite presentations because I love history. Um, really enjoyed it as a kid. My mom said I was going to be a history teacher. Obviously, that didn't pan out, but that's okay. And so we are going to be talking about the history of technology and how that has a parallel track with spiritualism, okay? Does anybody know what a channel is? Yeah. What do you think of when you think of a channel? You probably think of changing it, right, with the remote. Oxford Dictionary defines a channel as a medium for communication or the passage of information. And so... Um, even though we think of our, our channels on our TV, the word is actually much older than that. Because before there were clickers to change the channel on our televisions, people were known as channels. All right? Technology is fascinating. Um, it's important that we find a balance in technology because... We can be down on technology, we could be up on technology, but the important thing is to find out what God would have us do with technology, right? <clears throat> and so, I think of technology because I really like it, I appreciate the things that it does for my life. You know, just the other day, my son, he has this, um, has this Apple watch, and so he said, Dad, you, you should try this thing. So I wore it for a couple of days, and I thought, you know, this, this is really neat. You know, it keeps track of my activity. If I'm sitting too long, it tells me to stand up and move around. But, you know, I could see how that would add value to my life and be useful. <clears throat> you think about where we would be today without technology, because we've been able to spread the gospel much faster. I think of it in terms of medicine and the advancements that, that have been made. Think of the surgeries that we can now do that we could never do before. I think technology has added value to our lives. It can be used very positively to communicate and um, help people understand things. But there are some disadvantages to technology, and we talked about some of those. And I just want to 
uh, go down a path with you tonight to show you how some technology has been developed. I think it's important that we understand this, especially for the end of time. And I think it's, under, I think it's important that we understand one very foundational principle, and that is why we need to hold to this book and the message, messages in it more than anything else. I'd like for you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 3 this evening. Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 5. I find that as I study the Bible, I go to the beginning and the end about as much as anything else because it explains so much. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. I'm going to read this. It says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest what happens? You die. Right? Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God knowing good and evil. So God says one thing, and the serpent says, hogwash. That's not true at all. What God said was absolutely wrong. The word subtle here, it means crafty. And this is a term, if you think about uh, the occult, they call what they do the craft, right? This word, if you trace it, it can be traced all the way back to a pre-Indo-European word that means to turn. And the context of that word is a seafaring vessel, like a ship. So if you fly on an airplane or you sail a ship, you know that you chart a course when you take off. And what happens if you deviate that course by even one degree, you don't get to your destination. And this is exactly what Satan would love to do with each and every person here and each and every person listening. He wants to turn you off course, and he wants to do that just enough that you won't notice. But in the end, you do not reach your destination. It's interesting here that Satan used a serpent. He used a medium. You see, lies need a disguise. They cannot hold up to the scrutiny of the truth. And so they need some kind of distraction to divert the mind from discerning what the truth is. If we turn probably just a page over in your Bible to Genesis chapter 2, 16 and 17, it says this, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree in the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you will surely die. As far as I can tell, this is the very first thing that God asked them not to do. And what was the consequence? Death. Death has always been the consequence for disobeying God. It is the consequence of sin. Paul tells us this in Romans chapter 6. He says, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. So to understand why this is all so important, we need to understand what the Bible says about death. 
Is it death? Do you really die? Or do you just exist somewhere else eternally? <clears throat> the Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. You can think of this a lot like a math equation. All right, we have the dust of the ground. When you add to that the breath of life, then you get a living soul. But if you were to remove the breath of life or the dust of the ground, you no longer have a living soul. In fact, the Bible is very clear that God is the only one who has immortality. 1 Timothy 6 and 16 says, Who only, this is speaking of God, has immortality, dwelling in light which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Many cultures believe that people's souls are immortal. They just exist inherently on their own forever and ever. But God is very clear. He is the only one that possesses immortality. In Romans chapter 2 and verse 7, it tells us that we seek for immortality. If you're seeking for something, you don't already have it. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 53 through 54, it tells us that when Jesus comes back, we put on immortality, which tells us we do not possess that inherently. The Bible is very clear that we die. Ezekiel 18.4 says, Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sins, it shall die. We die. We don't continue to live. We are mortals. If you look up the word mortal in a dictionary, it means subject to death. Ecclesiastes 9.5 tells us, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know nothing. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. So if they don't know anything, how much information could they possibly pass on to you and I? None, because they don't know anything. And I think this verse in particular is very fascinating because it gives us a clue into the purpose of spiritualism. What was it that the serpent was trying to get Eve to see in the garden? And God was holding back some information. What is a channel or medium's purpose? The passage of information. The Bible also tells us in Psalm chapter 6 and verse 5, For in death there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave, who shall give you thanks? And also in Psalm 115, 17, The dead do not praise the Lord nor any that go down into silence. Now, who wrote many of the Psalms? Not all of them, but many of them. It was King David. And you would think if anybody was going to be praising the Lord at death, you would think it would be King David. And you would think he would be in heaven doing that. But the Bible tells us otherwise. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 34, it says, For David is not ascended into the heavens. But he has said himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit thou on my right hand. So if he didn't ascend into the heavens, he can only be in one place, in the grave. Isaiah chapter 8, verses 19 and 20, gives us a very strong warning. Well, maybe I shouldn't say it gives us a strong warning. Maybe I should say, it pauses and gives us a question. It says in verse 19, And when they say to you, Seek those who are mediums and wizards, who whisper and mutter, 
should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? Where are we to go for our information? We are to go to God. We are to go to God's word. We are not to go seeking information from those who are dead or passed on. Because the Bible's clear. They have no information for us. Verse 20 says this. To the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Deuteronomy chapter 18, 10 through 14 also says this. There shall not be found among you anyone. So how many people does that include? It includes everyone, right? There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire or one who practices witchcraft or a soothsayer or one who interprets omens or a sorcerer or one who conjures spells or a medium or a spiritist or one who calls up the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. And then he says this, you shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For these nations, which you will dispossess, listened to soothsayers and diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not appointed such for you. God's people are not to have anything to do with mediums, spiritists, soothsayers, diviners, or the like. In 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 16, speaking of King Manasseh, says this, Also he made his sons pass through the fire, practiced soothsaying, used witchcraft, and consulted spiritists and mediums. And then it says after that, And he did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Clearly God does not approve of this activity. So if the dead aren't speaking to us when they die, then who is? The Bible gives us a clue in Revelation chapter 16, verse 14. It says, For they are the spirits of demons, performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Spiritualism, essentially, is a counterfeit for prophecy. I cannot think of a biblical example where someone communicated with the dead and it turned out good. Not one. And if you are to take that road and participate in that kind of an activity, you're being put in a very difficult position. And it would be very challenging for you to withstand that. Because if you think about it, those people, your loved ones, your friends, you have an emotional bond to them, right? You see them, and you know what happens? You release oxytocin, like we talked about Friday night. That bond that's created between you and your body, they start, it starts releasing these chemicals. And it would be very difficult for you to resist that temptation and think, no, this is my relative. It's, it's perfectly safe when the Bible says, don't have anything to do with it. So what in the world does that have to do with media? Well, I'm about to tell you. Around the 1870s, science started seeing a breakthrough in many technologies that we use today. Things like telephones. They look a lot different, and these are not to scale by any means. 
things like televisions, which are smart now, right? They can listen to you and probably talk to you and all kinds of stuff. Things like radios. We can even beam radio from outer space right into our cars. Audio recorders, right? Small enough to fit in our pockets, and we we can record fantastic, wonderful sounds. My question, though, is who are the inventors? What did they believe? And what were they trying to achieve with the use of these technologies? Let's start with television. I'm just going to cover a couple of names in each of these categories. Two gentlemen who were very influential were Sir William Crookes and John Logie Baird. Uh, Crookes was an Englishman, and Baird was a Scotsman. And Sir William Crookes is credited as uh, inventing the cathode ray tube, um, the radiometer, and discovering the element thallium. Now, um, Crookes, well, I should back up, the cathode ray tube. How many of you remember the cathode ray tube? Yeah, you're probably closer to my age if you remember that or older. Young people are probably like, what in the world is a cathode ray tube? Well, I'll give you a clue. Maybe you remember they used to have these things called CRT monitors. They were big. They were heavy. That CRT stands for cathode ray tube. They used to put these in televisions. You, a long time ago, you used to have to warm the TV up, and you know, it took a long time for it to come on. We don't use that technology anymore. We use LEDs, right? But this is something from yesteryear. Well, Crooks, he had a brother named Philip who died in 1867. And after his brother died, he was invited to a seance to communicate with his deceased brother. And he once confided in a friend about the experience because he said it helped lead to many of his inventions. And this is what he said. I'm a one idea man, and all my discoveries have emanated from the idea that light must have a force of its own. And he said, basically, this idea came to me as an experience I had when going to seances. That's when inspiration struck. Well, after attending several seances, he was convinced enough of what he saw that he said, I have to start investigating this. You have to understand the mind of a Victorian English scientist. They did not believe that there was not a scientific explanation for what they were seeing. They believed everything had a scientific explanation, and so they decided we have to investigate. We don't think that it's just uh, religious or spiritual or anything like that. There has to be a, a physical phenomenon driving this force, and they were determined to find out what it was. Well, Crookes was very well known in the scientific community. He belonged to many organizations, some of which he was the president, and um, so they more or less appointed him to start studying mediums and communicating with the dead and seeing what was behind all of that. As he did that, he actually got a lot of criticism and feedback from his own community. Because when he published his results, the bottom line for him was, I can't find a scientific reason for why this is happening. And there has to be something else behind what's going on. And so they would bring railing accusations at him like, you're just old and senile now, or your eyesight is getting poor, and all kinds of things. And if he had not been the top scientist of his day, it would have completely ruined his career. But this is what he said. This is from his presidential address at the Bristol Society in 1898. He said, no incident in my scientific career is more widely known than the part I took many years ago in certain psychic researches. And he said, there exists a force exercised by intelligence differing from the ordinary intelligence common to mortals. He went on to say a few years later, I have never had any occasion to change my mind on the subject. I am perfectly satisfied with what I said in earlier days. It is quite true that a connection 
has been set up between this world and the next. Completely convinced. But if we go back to it, what was it that inspired him down this road? It was communicating with the dead. It is interesting to me that H.P. Blavatsky uh, recognizes Crookes' work in chemistry. In fact, she called his work ancient wisdom. And that his work, that it, um, what's the right word? It upheld theosophical beliefs. So a little bit of background on H.P. Blavatsky. To put it bluntly, she was a Satanist. She was the founder of the Theosophical Society, which many uh, wealthy aristocrat scientists of her day were a part of. And just to give you a little bit of an idea on what she believed, I'm going to read to you a quote from her book, The Secret Doctrine. This comes from page 79. She says, The devil is now called darkness by the church, whereas in the Bible he is called Son of God. See Job. The bright star of the early morning, Lucifer. There is a whole philosophy of dogmatic craft in the reason why the first archangel, who sprang from the depths of chaos, was called Lux, the luminous sun of the morning, or Manvantric dawn. He was transformed by the church into Lucifer, or Satan. And get this, because, her words, he is higher and older than Jehovah and had to be sacrificed to the new dogma. This is the kind of person that is saying, Crooks' work in chemistry, Crooks' work with mediums, this is good stuff. We should be doing more of it. She published this quote in 1888. John Logie Baird was an influential inventor when it came to television, more from the mechanical means versus electronic means. He was particularly instrumental in broadcast television. One author says this, during this period that he was working on it, as Baird developed Noctivision, as television was then called, he was attending spiritualist seances. And these dead inventors passed messages to him. And what did they do? They, they had advice. And they promised to assist him in his work. That should be very interesting. If we know that when you are dead, you're dead. And we know that when people who claim to be communicating with the dead, they're not really communicating with the dead. They're communicating with demons. Then ask yourself this question. Why would they be interested in helping develop technology? I'll let you think on that. Another author says, the brilliant British scientist John Logie Baird, famous for his invention of the television and the infrared camera, reported he had successfully contacted the deceased Edison through a medium. What about the telephone? Two people who were influential in this, one very well known, Sir Alex, or not Sir, Alexander Graham Bell, and Thomas Watson. And if you know your history, you know that Thomas Watson was his assistant. Less well known, but still uh, famous in his own right. Well, Alexander Graham Bell was sent a letter by his Aunt Mabel. And she really encouraged him to check out Crooks' work in the supernatural. She said, there's something here. I think you need to study this and, and check it out. And so this prompted um, him and his brother to sign a pact together. And they said, whoever died first, we need to come up with some means of uh, communicating with each other that is more reliable than the seance medium. So they decided to use technology. This promise was prompted by his brother's wife. Um, she took up spiritualism after their one-year-old son died from tuberculosis, and she went to seances to communicate with her one-year-old child. 
he said this, I well remember how often in the stillness of the night I've had little seances all by myself in the half hope, half fear of receiving some communication. This is what he writes back to his Aunt Mabel in a letter that even though he tried, he was very unsuccessful in making communication with the dead. And so for him, it actually led to many doubts later on, and spiritualism more or less drifted out of his life. Watson, on the other hand, was a lot more serious than Bell. And it really manifested itself in the work that he was doing. One author says this, even Thomas Watson, the famed assistant to Alexander Graham Bell, experimented with the telephone as an aid to spiritual communication. Another one says this, Watson attended nightly seances and apparently made several successful connections to the dead. Once again, we see seances as a powerful tool to entice people. And so we know from history that Because he was involved in this, it colored his views on science and spiritualism and vice versa. And he viewed mediums as people with special powers and that they could transform bodily radiations into mechanical forces and and all kinds of things like that. And he was trying to make something that seemed very illogical something very logical. Another person writes that Watson secretly sought out the advice of a medium at a critical juncture in Bell's experiments because they were hoping that they could give the telephone a boost. But did he pray and ask God about it? No. It's amazing where he went looking for his wisdom. Well, what about the radio? Two guys who were very influential in radio were Sir Oliver Lodge and Marconi. I'm not going to try to butcher his first name. Lodge was a British physicist. He actually held a lot of patents when it came to wireless telegraphy. He was a pioneer in radio. He was also very fascinated with spiritualism. What probably drove this was he lost his son at 21 years old in, I believe, World War I. After he lost his son, whose name was Raymond, he started going to seances to try to call up his son and communicate with him. And he wrote a book on it after the first name of his son. And in the book, um, his son tells him, his son, quote unquote, tells him many things. And he tells him what heaven is like, for example. And in this communication, you can see how it appeals to Lodge's nature because he told him that heaven was full of cigars and whiskey sodas which just happened to be two of Lodge's advices. Marconi, a very famous uh, inventor, pioneered long-distance radio transmission. He was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in physics for his achievements. One author tells us that Crookes, Bell, Marconi, and others firmly believed in the power of seances to reach paranormal entities. And Marconi went so far as to attempt direct communication with spirits using radio signals. Another one writes that he believed in spiritualism, the continuation of life after death, the ability to communicate with those in spirit, and that he spent his last years trying to perfect some type of device that could establish a permanent connection between this world and the next. What about audio recorders? Thomas Edison, holder of 1,093 patents. He probably needs the least amount of introduction with everybody that we have covered. Very famous scientist. But I'm going to tell you a few things that you probably have never heard about Thomas Edison. One of them is that just like Crookes, he was a member of the Theosophical Society that Blavatsky started. And to people who knew him well, they knew some things about him that most of the rest of us don't. Here is a quote 
um, that somebody wrote. They said, a gentleman in Port Huron, Michigan, writing to Mr. Eggleston of New York, states as follows. I have known Thomas Edison from a boy and all his father's family. His parents are good spiritualists. And a son, William Pitt Edison, was, pronounced a, was a pronounced believer in the phenomenon. And I understand that Thomas is also a believer in spirit return and mediumship, but that he does not talk upon the subject except to persons he is familiar with. So this is why you do not find it in your history books, is because he was very guarded and very careful who he talked about his beliefs to. Another person wrote this, Thomas Alva Edison believed that an electronic device could be built to communicate with the dead. And in fact, I have the PDF of science magazines of the day showing how Edison was trying to build that device. And essentially, if you really want to boil it down, you could say that Edison was a ghostbuster. I choose that term carefully. The person who wrote the last quote, his name is Peter Ackroyd. And Peter Ackroyd is the father of a very famous actor named Dan Ackroyd. And he wrote a book entitled, A History of Ghosts, The True Story of Seances, Mediums, Ghosts, and Ghostbusters. And this book is about their family's history with spiritualism, which goes back to the mid-1800s. Their family, at that time, had their own seance medium, and they would have nightly seances around the table. Dan Aykroyd says this, Am I a trance medium? No. Have I got a gift psychically? Absolutely not. But I believe in the survival of consciousness after death, which is probably what prompted him to make a TV show in that regard. He also said, I've been a very big fan of science fiction and of the worlds of the spiritual and the mystic. He's also quoted as saying, American Society of Psychical Research Journals were all around the house when I was a kid. He also said, my great-grandfather, Sam Aykroyd, was a dentist in Kensington, Ontario. He was an Edwardian spiritualist researcher who was very interested in what was going on in the invisible world. The survival of the consciousness, precipitated paintings, mediumship, and trans-channeling. And he finally says of himself, I am a spiritualist, a proud wearer of the spiritualist badge. So when he writes the script of Ghostbusters and stars in the film, He's not just making a movie. He is sharing his beliefs with you on screen. <clears throat> now, television, the internet, medium in general, is not the only place that we find these kind of ideas. They exist further back than that. You can find them in literature. A couple of people you might be familiar with, Charles Dickens, right? And he wrote a book, many of you probably know the title of, called A Christmas Carol. And in The Christmas Carol, you'll find three prominent characters. The ghost of Christmas past, of Christmas present, and of Christmas future, right? Dickens uh, was a spiritualist. Also, the creator of Sherlock Holmes was a spiritualist as well. Sir, Connor, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. He was a member of the Ghost Club with William Crooks and Sir Oliver Lodge. And Sir Arthur Conan Doyle actually wrote an entire book on the history of spiritualism, one of his lesser known works. The interesting part, uh, at least to me, about all of this is that it's closely associated with um, taking root as part of the great disappointment from America's second revival, second great 
um, awakening spiritually. America's second great awakening started in about 1820. Protestantism, the messages of Jesus coming soon, started sweeping across the country. People were having meetings and tents like this all over the place, and, and people were being one to the Lord left and right. There was a great spiritual revival. And this movement continued in our country until about 1844. <clears throat> we oftentimes don't think of all these events happening around the same time, but they did. We have a tendency to compartmentalize history and say, this happened over here, and this happened over here, and this happened over here. But that's not the way it happened. Spiritualism was on the rise. At the same time, many Protestant movements were on the rise, right? Not very, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, but during that time, there was a group of people called the Millerites who were preaching that Jesus was coming soon. And they became very disappointed when Jesus didn't come soon. It's interesting that spiritualism in this country started to really take off right after that event. In about 1846, the Fox sisters came on the scene. And in my mind, as I'm looking at the pieces of history lining up, I'm saying, here is a group of people in America, a lot of people waiting for Jesus to come soon. They didn't see the greatest event in history. And so what does the devil do? I have something for you to see. Come check this out over here. You can experience it. You can see it. The Bible tells us, I'll say this again, and when they shall seek to you, unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and mutter, should not a people seek their God? For the living to the dead, we are to look to God for our wisdom, for the questions that we have in life. If you go to the Fox Sisters' home today, you will find this plaque, which is very hard to read, but I'll read it for you. It says, Spiritualists of the World, in commemoration of the advent of modern spiritualism. At Hydesville, New York, March 31, 1848. And in tribute to mediumship, the rock iron which demonstrable stands, forever stands, they said, there is no death. There are no dead. A little bit more history on the Fox sisters. If you dig up the papers from the day, you'll find um, that this phenomenon started in their home. Um, it started when they were communicating with a a being called Mr. Slipfoot. And as they started to communicate, uh, they worked out a system of communication with uh, taps and wrapping on, you know, different parts of the house, so the walls and floors and stuff. And they became very popular. People started to come. Neighbors started to come. People from all over the country started to come and see what it is what they were doing because they could communicate with the dead. Many people of the day, like Harry Houdini, would follow them around and try to expose them as frauds. And eventually they got so much attention and they, they had enough pressure that one of the sisters, she went out into the news and proclaimed publicly, although she was actually paid, it was somewhere like $1,500 or $2,500. Um, and she said, you know what? It was all fake. None of it was really real. We completely made it up. And they were m not trusted after that. It brandished their name. And, uh, you know, nobody would really listen to them. But that event did kickstart spiritualism, spiritualism in this country. And it skyrocketed after that. And that same sister, about a year later, she tried to come back to the press and say, you know, it really wasn't true what I said. It really was all real. But by that time, their credibility had been damaged. And isn't that just like Satan? To use somebody 
and then cast them away, brandish their credibility so that no one will listen to them anymore. The Bible tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, are we in the latter times? Yes, we are. Some will depart from the faith. And do you know why? The Bible says they will give heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. The Bible also tells us in 1 John 4, 1, that we are not to believe every spirit. And why is that? It tells us to test the spirits because many false prophets have gone out into the world. How do you test the spirits? You have to have something to compare it to. You have to have a standard of truth. You see, media is a vehicle. It's a very powerful tool. But like many powerful tools, different people have different ideas on how it should be used. You know, I think the problem with most media today is it lulls us into what I would call a fatal security. It dulls our conscience to what sin is. We watch terrible things and see them happen to the point where it's just normal. I once was told a story about an Amish gentleman. He was with a group of friends. And um, they had the television on. He was there. And he witnessed something on television. I think it was a Western. And you know how a lot of Westerns end. Somebody gets shot. He seen that person get shot. Ran out of the room. Throwing up. His friends, baffled, went after him. What's wrong with you? You know, what's going on? What's the big deal? And then one of them realized... And he said, no, what's wrong with us? It's not normal to see people gunned down. And in fact, God never intended for any of us to ever see that. Despite the fact that we can use technology for very good things, the reality of the situation is, most of the time, it isn't. And sadly, many people will succumb to deceptive theology. If you look at a lot of media today, spiritualism is running rampant in programming. I want to start to wrap this up with three quotes. They're from a gentleman you may have heard his name before. His name is Anton LaVey. How many of you heard of Anton LaVey? A couple of you. Okay, if you've never heard of Anton LaVey, I will tell you. He is credited as being the founder of the Church of Satan in the United States. Okay? He has some very interesting things to say before he died in 1992. He said this, There are television sets in every home. Does it seem like that's true today? Every restaurant, every hotel room, and every shopping mall. Written in 1992 that, that almost seems prophetic, although I'm sure it was true then, it's even more true now. They're even small enough to carry in your pocket like electronic rosaries. Now, he wasn't talking about these. Because back then, you could actually get Walkman TVs that, you know, if you had big pockets, it would fits in the pocket, but kind of eerie. It is an unquestioned part of everyday life. Isn't it that the way it is now? It's just unquestioned. I mean, we just consume entertainment, no question. Kneeling before the cathode ray God with our TV guide concordance in hand, we maintain the illusion of choice by flipping channels, chapters, and verses. You see, 
most people, even a lot of Christians, are not discreet with their media choices. You know how I know that? I used to be one. I used to go home and turn whatever on. And I am not proud to say that in one point in my life, I did not hesitate to put anything before my eyes. And you can interpret that any number of ways. I'll let you use your imagination. But that's not what God wanted for my life. He also said this, the birth of TV was a magical event. Interesting choice of words. Foreshadowing its satanic significance. What does he mean by that? The first commercial broadcast was aired on Walpurgis Nacht, April 30th, 1939, at the New York World's Fair. Since then, TV's infiltration has been so gradual, so complete, that no one even noticed. People don't need to go to church anymore. They get their morality plays on television. Now, I want to broaden his, his target. He's talking about television. But keep in mind, we have television with us all the time now. So he may be talking about TV, but this is broadly applicable to your gaming consoles, the phone in your pockets, etc., etc., your computer. Now, what does he mean by satanic significance? Well, Purgisnacht happens to be six months away from Halloween. It is the second most sacred day in paganism. Only Halloween is considered to be more sacred to pagans. And he also said this, the TV set or satanic family altar has grown more elaborate since the early 50s, from the tiny fuzzy screens to huge entertainment centers covering entire walls with several TV monitors. What started as an innocent respite from everyday life has become a replacement for real life for millions, a major religion of the masses. And you think even now in our day, we have all kinds of reality television, if you will. Um, one of my coworkers now used to work in reality television, and so did his brother. And they will tell you, it is not reality, right? It's all for the cameras. Matthew 24, 24 says this, For there shall arise, talking about the last days, false Christs, false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders that if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. Over and over again, Jesus said, do not be deceived. Why is that? Because Jesus knew that in the last days, there were going to be many deceptions. Now, I'm not reading this text and saying that technology is necessarily fulfilling exactly this verse. But I will say this. In the last days, the Bible does teach that we will see things and we will hear things that are designed to mislead us. And I think that technology is part of that. If I could put it another way, the audiovisuals will be overwhelming. They will lie to your senses. And the only thing that you will be able to trust is this book. So big picture, television, media in general, your computers, your phones, whatever, is the fastest way that I can think of to spread error. And if you want to fill your mind with the right messages, you have to make sure that you're getting them from the right source. So do your homework. The purpose in Eden of using a medium was this, to discredit or undermine the word of God. And the purpose of spiritualism in the end of time is the same thing, to undermine the word 
of God. Be careful what you watch, right? Isn't there a little song that goes like that? Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Because I believe this is one of the vehicles that Satan will use to lead people astray from the Bible. This media is a great teaching tool. If you're going to use it, teach the Word of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, in these last days, we want to be wise. We do not want to fall prey to the deceptions of the enemy. And Lord, we ask that you would teach us, even though these things have an unfortunate history, Teach us how to use them for your honor and glory. Teach us how to use them for your purpose. Guard and protect our minds that we would not fall prey to deception or addiction. I pray that you would be with all those that are watching online, Lord. Help them to understand the times that we are living in and the seriousness, the gravity of the situation that we're dealing with. There are many events on the horizon that are going to be very challenging in the last days. Help us to be prepared. Help us to be ready. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. I hope that presentation was enlightening. I hope it did not scare you too much. Um, It's one of my favorite presentations, and it just shows how important the Word of God is in our lives, how we need to be reading it, and consuming it, and knowing it. Because otherwise, we won't know the difference between truth and error. As Pastor Chris said, uh, we have some DVDs at the back that covers this type of information. We also have some t-shirts if you like to, as we say, wear your witness. And um, that's one way you can help support our ministry. You can also go to littlelightstudios.tv. You can donate there. Uh, You can also check us out on YouTube. We put out a weekly show on YouTube talking about uh, current issues in culture and society and media and trying to help people navigate those things by the Word of God. So I encourage you to check it out, subscribe, and tune in so that you can be better educated and also have a resource to share with your friends and family. So thank you for coming, and I want to wish everyone a good night.